how did you choose the name of your CBD shop, Artemis? Yeah. So Colin and I were talking back and forth, and we we wanted something that had roots in a very uh, familiar but very kind of ancient way. You know, like yeah. Artemis, the goddess of health, the goddess of fertility, the world, the goddess of womanhood. Um, and it since we were, you know, the only women own store in mm-hmm. wanted to represent that with you know our branding as well so i think that kind of bloomed into who she is who the woman yeah. we wanted to right because this woman is also protecting other women in, in her yep. life too that was our kind of our audience um and we wanted to surround that ethos as much as possible yeah. you know having a reaction uh, working with Dr. Neil Chin, who's also a woman, you know, doing um, the Etain partnership, who's also woman-owned in that sense. Um, and everything in the store had just themes of nature yeah. around. Um, Artemis is there. Um, her hero tree is actually a cypress tree. So we have two little cypress in the store. Nice, you know? wow. And she's the goddess of the wilderness, so we have birds everywhere in the store. So there's lots of greenery in the store. Um, there's lots of old books in the store rooting back again to something that's familiar yeah but that's new yeah that sense, you know? um but everything happened very naturally and very organically and we wanted um so the our logo is actually the stag which is yeah. again artemis hero animal um and we wanted to incorporate cbd in that in that so the head of the stag is actually the head of the compound and the oh. antler compound but it's fun you know wow duplicated. yeah so we had a one um <laughs> chemical in and he's like oh my gosh i see the chemical you know structure in your logo i said thank goodness someone noticed because <laughs> that was part of our brand we really wanted yeah. it in a much more um you know much medical much more scientific way mm-hmm. and that built into our logo too as well Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I'll I'll have to go back and look at it now. I hadn't caught that. That's great. And one of the reasons I ask is um, what I thought of when I first, when I learned about your story and learned about the store and saw the name and everything, I know that you're a very big advocate for juvenile justice. And one of the things that popped in my head when I saw that and why I wanted to ask you why you chose the name was because I know that Artemis is also known as like a... um, protector goddess for children and particularly for for uh young women and so um that was another thing i wanted to bring up to see if um the choice of artemis connected to your personal story and your mission for you know supporting reforms to juvenile justice systems foster care systems and that sort of thing i'm just so incredibly humbled and thankful that you saw that because that was not necessarily an active part of the branding that was just the dna that we that we breathe you know um, wow yeah wow you know you know that artemis is just a part <laughs> of who we are and who she is and that was just what we were doing you know we don't we didn't really think about that side of it yeah um but i think for me protecting young women has been it will ever be will always be an ongoing mission um you know when it comes to juvenile justice, we have to rewind back and understand why are these, you know, young youths and kids um, being placed there in the first place. Yeah. Right? Most of them are from broken homes and most of them are from foster care. Mm-hmm. So when, you know, with me being in the foster care system, you know, I remember um, meeting with my social worker and there's a lot of things that needs to be changed within the foster care system. And I hope that's better now than when I was back in it, you know, in, in the 90s and, and to early 2000s. Uh, but, you know, I saw my social worker once a month, maybe, you know, mm-hmm. we barely talked and she took a few notes or whatever it was. But one thing she said to me that changed my life was that, and I was very happy that she was very blunt and very honest, mm-hmm. um, you know, for you guys, meaning foster kids, um, 30% of you will, women will be pregnant by the time you emancipate, 30% will be homeless and 30% will be incarcerated. And 10% will make it and make wow. it meaning, you know, barely getting by, you mm-hmm. know, and then all of that, maybe a few of you will actually succeed. And I was terrified of being homeless because I, I knew that I wouldn't do anything wrong in a sense 
to become pregnant because I wasn't dating. It was just my focus was just to make it out alive. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to get myself in trouble to be incarcerated, you know. So I at least I can control those two elements in my right. life um, by being very just being home all the time and just kind of buying the rules. But being homeless is something that was very real to me. So going back to kind of Art of Business mission, most of the kids in um, the juvenile justice system are a product of foster mm -hmm. care and their choice of being incarcerated or homeless, it's very real, you know? I actually worked in a um, in the highest security uh, juvenile um, detention center back in San Francisco when I was living mm. in San Francisco. I was actually a teacher in there. Wow. Um, so I right, and now I work from the outside in that sense. And, you know, every, honestly, it was maximum security. It was an all boys unit, um, not necessarily by choice for me because it was the closest detention center that I was living next to at the time in San Francisco. And most of my students were from foster care. You know, they had their interaction with foster care at one point in their lives or other, and that led them to where they are now. So all of those pieces were very real when I was going through it. And now, you know, it's just always on the top of my mind to make sure that we do our best to make sure that kids don't go through the same or have the lack of opportunities that, you know, that the system is built on. And it's unfortunately it's still the exact same thing. Yeah. Well, and, and what was that transition for you like? Because uh, from my understanding of your story, you entered the foster care system uh, fairly late at like, what was it, like 15 years old, something like that? Um, so uh, for me, I, yeah, I was taken out of my home at um, about 15 um, and I was placed in a group home uh, for six weeks and four days. It sounds like, you know, when we talk about group homes, it's almost a real sentence. You know, like I know exactly what I was in and out. Um, and then after that, I was placed in a foster home. Mm -hmm. So a group home, I think, is just a soft way of saying um, an orphanage. All yeah. the kids get yeah. trapped into this, and then they get shuffled out in whatever district that they're in. And, um, you know, the foster home that I was placed in was very close to my biological family. You know, so I didn't understand this growing up. Because I thought if the abuse happened at home, why is my foster home so close to my home? You right, know? right. But you realize that the system is built where they advocate um, re just reuniting with your with your biological family. That's the first priority. Mm -hmm. um, and, th and if it's not healthy, then separation is the second priority. So I always thought that was very counterintuitive because that scared the heck out of me all the time. Because I felt mm -hmm. like they were just so close that they can come back at any time to have those abuse happen again, you know, but as adults, I understand now. Um, but, you know, for me, I was sexually abused when I was five. And then again, when I was 12, and again, when I was 14, from different family members living in the home. Right? And I remember at 15, I told my parents and I said, I can't live like this. Like, I just, mm -hmm. they saw everything. I mean, I told them everything. They saw half of it. And I said, you know, I can't live like this. And I, there needs to be some something to change or whatever that is and they just didn't take action and i knew if i were at home my life would be very very different you know um i yeah. tried suicide when i was 14 uh, i tried doing it again when i was 15 and so i just i think for me it was if i to be alive i needed to get away from the situation that was it yeah so I called the only person i knew who happened to be a teacher um she was I think she was an elementary school teacher. To be honest, I don't remember what she was teaching. But she was a teacher, and by law, as you know, you know your yep. family, you have family that are in, in the teaching education yep. side. Uh, they had to report the abuse, and so when I, you know, I was a runaway basically staying with her, and she reported the abuse, and then so social services got involved, and they opened my case with the investigator, and that became a huge the the there was two criminal charges against two my two my cousins, and yeah. it was a lot too um i had no idea that the moment i left the house to stay with her this was going to happen yeah i i was going to stay with this woman who's going to help me and then i'm just going to go home like some right because you know at the time to the social my school call social services a few times and they would visit the home because there was also physical abuse from my father but um, they'll call you know they'll come to the home they'll check up on me the mm -hmm. right report leave so i thought it would be the same thing this time though someone's going to come write a report and then leave mm -hmm. i had no idea that i was officially placed in foster care at 
that moment. So I never saw my family again after I left. And that was wow. it. And my family didn't want to see me again. So it was kind of, it kind of worked out. But at the age of 15, I just couldn't understand anything. I, I just yeah, understood. Yeah. I don't know why. I just couldn't understand anything. And I couldn't understand why this was happening. And the, there was a, a criminal charge. Like I didn't understand any of that, mm-hmm. you know. And But because of that, um, I had to be placed under um, psychiatric care. Yeah. I was diagnosed with depression at 15. I actually didn't get treatment until I was 20. Oh, my gosh. And then I was with PTSD when I was um, also 15 and a half. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you were young at the time, I thought I was going to grow out of it. You know? Right. Like, yeah. It's like, it'll pass. It'll be fine. Yeah. It'll pass. You know, whatever. And I didn't realize that was going to catch up with me 10 years later. And I'm still, you know, dealing with it now. But no one tells you that when you're, you know, five right. or 15. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I can only imagine how, you know, the, the anxiety, depression, you know, all of that. I just, I have my own struggles with, with some of those issues. So I can empathize um, with what that battle is like, because it it doesn't just go away when life gets good. (laughs) I mean, I think for me, I never, every time when life gets good, I think my mechanism is always to think it's going to get bad. Yes, yes, exactly. Because that's always been kind of my life journey. And I've been so blessed, honestly, with everything that's happening now. I always think it's going to crumble. And living like that is not healthy long term. I think it motivates you. It makes you vicious, right? It makes you go forward. But that internal kind of low level stress that happens every day thinking that everything is going to crumble any day now. It's not a healthy way to live. And I didn't understand a healthier way to live until much later in my life and and to deal with all that stress now, you know. But, you know, before, every time when, if I'm in an elevator, it doesn't matter where I am. If I'm in an elevator and the door opens, I have an anxiety attack. I always think my parents or my cousins or oh, on the other side. yeah. That's what happened when I was going through my court cases. They're mm-hmm. always there on the other side. So I, I just didn't connect the dots until I got old enough mm-hmm. to understand it's not a good mechanism to respond to a stressor like this. Yeah. And also, like, wh- how can I manage this where it can open and they can be there or they cannot be there, but I'm still okay. You know, like, yeah. not that. So I think my journey with just seeking a more natural way has blended in with my own coping mechanism of how I deal with all the trauma that's mm-hmm. happened and what were some of the changes that you started to make in your life to deal with some of those internal feelings and thoughts, um, that anxiety, the the panic attacks? What were some of the lifestyle changes that you began to make to address that? That's a really, really good question. You know, um, I think for me, I learned, this is probably not the healthiest, Jason, but it's, it's <laughs> You know, I'm just very honest with you. Um, I learned that if I can zone my energy into keeping someone else safe, I feel safer. Mm-hmm. So believe it or not, having a cat for me changed my life because mm-hmm. I thought if I can protect my cat, I feel protected myself because no one protected that little girl mm-hmm. in me when I was younger. So if I can transfer that, then maybe I can work through my own issues too as well. And given that I have, I have three cats now, but when I started with one, that really changed my perspective on things that I, when I see that he's happy, I can go, maybe no one was there for my little girl. Someone's there now. Mm-hmm. It's because it's not the same mechanism I'm employing with my cat. So I'm okay with that as an adult, you know? So I think having those conversations has been very rewarding and has been very therapeutic for me. Yeah. Get as a um, I also think that, you know, I got off the antidepressants, um, you know, when, back then when I was very young because I didn't have insurance. I didn't know mm-hmm. how to get it afterwards, you know. So I started cutting my pills until I was weaning myself off of it. Um, and I, I knew what it felt like. The good thing about that journey for me was I knew what it felt like when there was that storm yeah. always over you, yeah. right? When you're walking, there's always cloudy, it's always rainy over your head. And you don't know how to get rid of that cloud, no matter how mm-hmm. hard you try exercising, hiking, <laughs> and you cannot get rid of that cloud um, until that chemical structure was changed, right? Yep. So when I was on the antidepressants, I saw the cloud lifted 
So I was able to see what happened when I had the cloud and when I did not have the cloud. Ah, uh, yeah. Right? When there's symptoms of the cloud coming, I go, ah, I get it. Yeah. It's coming. Yep. And now it's resolved because I know it's like not having it there. So I think that has been a huge just reflection point for me in my journey in that sense. Um, and the introduction of CBD, I think, just really empowered me to get my life back on track. Hmm. I went from having 24 episodes. Um, and, you know, honestly, growing up and youth being in being in foster care and also being as an adult, preventative care was never something that was on top of my mind. I, I, used to, I can't, I never was brought up with that. I was never trained. So yeah. when I got, I would see a doctor, right? Yeah. But I didn't like take vitamin C to not get sick mm-hmm. when I was young. So that transfer into my lifestyle as, as an adult, yeah. where I got an episode, I see a doctor. And then they prescribe me something. And I thought he knew everything or she knew everything. It's going to work. That's it. So that response system was always ingrained in me until I realized it was not working anymore yeah. where the doctor couldn't help me find the solution. Yeah. And from my perspective to change from relying on someone to being my own yeah. advocate was the biggest change for me. And that was when CBD came in to help me with that. So now I'm much more preventative. Like I take CBD. I also take um, Demandos, which is an anti-inflammatory mm. um, supplement too as well. Uh, you know, I, I try to move as much more of that side as possible. Mm-hmm. And within the last year or two, I went from 24 episodes in a year to two a year. Oh, wow. And that never happened in my life. Yeah. I went from every day being on antibiotics to only being on it on antibiotics last year in 2019, just twice. Wow. You know? Yeah. So I know it works because th- I tried it. everything. Yeah. I lived it. I tried everything and it did not work. And this to me has really significantly improved my quality of life. Yeah. When I get my episodes, I still need help. Mm-hmm. So I need, you know, something stronger, but my biggest priority is not to have them at all. 